there we go so welcome everybody welcome to this um episode and i am joined by the wonderful um emily pretties from quiet mind coaching emily thank you so much for joining me today um what i'd love for you to do is just to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about you and what you do Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. This is very exciting. Uh, and hopefully there's some people uh, listening or will be listening that um, will get some value from this. So my name is Emily Prudis, so that bit's good. And I am the founder of Quiet Mind Coaching. So yes, um, I set up Quiet Mind Coaching around two years ago um, because I recognised that I'd been on my own mental health journey and was very fortunate enough to come out the other side of what was a very difficult um, illness in my childhood I had anorexia and um, it nearly killed me uh, and I'm very fortunate that I got to live a very full uh, life um, I got to become an operational police officer I got to get married and have children live in a lovely house own a dog you know see some of the world and there are so many um, people that don't get that opportunity because of the debilitating uh, impact that disordered eating has on people um, so I set up Quiet Mind Coaching um, as a way to support women with um, disordered eating initially. So that can vary from anything as a diagnosed eating disorder, although some of those do require clinical interventions. And it's very important that I state now that I'm not a therapist. I am, in fact, a coach. So the pe people that I work with, the women I work with, need to um, have gone through a bit of a process and be ready to make some serious changes and have some you know, real challenging conversations about what's going on for them and what they're going to do. But it can also so go to um, emotional eating. So it doesn't have to be a diagnosable eating disorder. It can just be disordered eating or eating problems. And from working with these women, what I found was um, that the eating side of things very often comes from underlying stresses and strains. They can predominantly start in your younger years, but actually people are developing them as adults because life is hard and particularly parenting brings for women a whole new range of uh, difficult emotions to deal with and that can sometimes impact their eating so I've kind of transitioned I still work with disordered eating but I also work along with uh, women around dealing with um, stress um, feeling it used to be called imposter syndrome I don't think they call it that anymore but dealing with those overwhelming emotions to essentially find peace with themselves and who they are <laughs> <laughs> and that's you you hit the nail on the head there like especially becoming a parent is just your world is just opened up to oh overwhelm craziness identity crisis every everything absolutely everything so it's it's wonderful that you support women um with that and also coming from a place of understanding and going through it yourself is just just brilliant so um what I'd love for you to do Emily is just tell us a little bit kind of about your because you've got children yourself um just a little bit kind of about your motherhood journey um would be great okay right so um my immediate family emigrated to uh New Zealand when I was young so I have a very supportive husband I'm very fortunate um and his parents are local but working in the force doing shift work and um, being new parents uh I did find the transition very difficult I would say I'd hold my hands up now and say I am not a natural mother um and weirdly what I've learned is I'm like my mother <laughs> in many respects and that came as a bit of a shock to me because when we grow up we do pick holes in our parents parenting styles and you say I'm never going to do that and I'm never going to do that and I'm going to be much more like that and then you kind of grow up and and there will be some things that you definitely won't do but there's also a lot of things that you think oh my gosh my mother just came out of my mouth there what happened there um yes um my sister came and stayed with us when I had my my daughter uh, so that was a bit odd she was 19 and she wanted to come back to the UK and do a bit of exploring um it was welcome but it was a bit it changed it a little bit um and the truth be told um I felt completely out of my depth with my daughter um she was great she was a great kid but I remember her belly button got infected and I didn't know what to deal with how to deal with it so I basically just didn't so my sister said 
that's not right, Emily, you need to go and get some medical intervention. And everything just seemed really hard. She was quite small. Um, I kind of juggled breastfeeding for a bit. And then I did bottle feeding because I found that too much. Um, I just felt like lots of things were very hard. Uh, and sometimes the health visitors weren't always um, that caring. Uh, and it was almost as though because I'm a normal functioning person, they were like, yeah, just get on with it. I was like, well, just be just because I'm not on the social services register or, or you know, have any particular issues, that doesn't mean I'm finding this easy. Um, so I did feel very much out of my depth. Um, she was a bit of a picky eater, although we've, we've come around that. So then um, by the time I had my son, so there's about just over three and a half years between them. Um, just uh, when I had my son, I said three and a half years, two and a half years, forgive me, I have to do my maths. Uh, I, it was a long time ago. So by the time I had my son, I felt a bit more in the groove then. I did, uh, there was things that I just basically just didn't care about as much. Uh, I didn't get myself so uptight about, you know, reading the books about how you should do this and you should, oh my goodness, the books. Um, yeah, so I felt a bit more in my stride. And I think both my children are very different, but what I would say is probably my relationship with my kids is quite different and it's probably in part to do with how I approach parenthood for each of them uh but yeah they're great kids so uh, my daughter's 12 uh, my son's nine absolutely great great kids I feel very fortunate to have them uh not still it is life's still difficult throws up a few challenges every now and then my daughter's recently had an assessment for OCD um that's possibly come out of COVID and some other things so yeah life's constantly throwing up challenges uh but yeah, great kids, and I feel very lucky. Yeah, and that's really, um, like, I, I think, like, when we spoke before, like I said, that we kind of, we get handed this child once we've given birth or when we, we get a baby, and they just kind of wave you off, and they're like, okay, bye, good luck. And, like, you have um, some natural kind of instincts about, I know I need to keep this kid alive, so I know I need yeah. to feed them. <laughs> Um, and I know that I need to change their nappy and, and to keep them clean. But outside of that, I really don't know what I'm doing um, because <laughs> it's well, a lot. It is a lot. And I still maintain that I didn't actually fall in love with my children until they were three months old. Up until that point, it was literally just survival mode. I've got to keep this very small demanding thing alive. Um, yeah. And I appreciate not the experience of everyone, um, but that was that was my experience. Yeah, I didn't feel that love, that connection until they until I'd got through the bit where I was like, oh, my God, am I, am I going to be able to keep this baby alive? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's that's really, really true for, for many people. Um, and it's interesting when you say like um, you have an idea of kind of how you're going to prepare and or things you aren't going to do or things you are going to do. Um, I remember like for my baby shower, my um, my aunt had bought me like a dummy um and um we called it the joke dummy because my aunt is very old school okay love her to bits but very old school and she's like oh you know we don't give babies dummies and I was like oh no we, we don't give babies dummies just because of what I had experienced like growing up um but something inside me told me to keep it so it was like the joke dummy from the baby shower but I kept it and I remember the first night home from the hostel um with my son and he would not stop crying and I remember screaming at my husband get the joke dummy go and find the joke dummy yeah. <laughs> and he's like what are you talking about and like the one from auntie carol go and get the joke dummy um, and I put the dummy in and he stopped crying. And I was like, well, I'm using a dummy from now on. So <laughs> it works. And, and it's funny because things change from child to child. So um, luckily, my daughter was a really good sleeper, but my son was a terrible sleeper. Um, and up until he was about four or five, he would wake up at half past four in the morning. He dropped his daytime sleep before he was one. Like it was ridiculous. Um, and what I found was because by 18 months, he could climb out of his cot and he would climb out of his cot. Um, lie on his back and kick the radiator and his room is directly next to my daughter's room so I was like oh my gosh we cannot have this so he'd come into bed with us because that's the only way I could settle him that's the situation I was in um you know by the time he was two he was trying to wrench the baby gate off the top of the stairs like this boy was determined chatting. yeah <laughs> so I was like right just get into bed if that's what it has to be then just get into bed and yeah so I think sometimes there is that temptation to just 
there's that, that conflict, isn't there, of this is what Gina Ford tells me. I'm not going to get on my soapbox about Gina Ford, but this is what she tells me. Either and- am I, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> this is what two o'clock in the morning having to get up for work in four hours with a child that's not sleeping and one that needs to sleep this is what me is telling me right now whatever works absolutely Abs- oh my ab- absolutely I always say to people I could stand here all day and tell you the healthy sleep habits of babies but actually it's you that's there in the in the night and you if what you're doing you're happy with it and you're getting some sleep and everyone's safe I don't particularly care what you do. You do what you've got to do to, like you say, get through the night, get up for work, deal with multiple children or even just one child during the day. Um, it's you just you've got to do what works for you as a family. So absolutely. And, and it, because you're constantly, especially at those two o'clock in the mornings, you're constantly like, Am I am I doing the right thing? Is this what impact is this gonna have? You know. And there's always that, and we talked about this didn't we, when we had our chat, that kind of mum guilt, that it literally, it's like a, a switch is pressed from the moment you kind of fall pregnant, really, because everyone's telling you what you can and can't eat and, you know, where you should and shouldn't walk and whatever. Um, and it stays. And what I'm learning is that actually it doesn't really go away. <laughs> no, this is really interesting to hear because obviously my, well, my son's about to turn six, but there will be people listening that are either about to have a baby, have got a newborn or their baby's only a month old. So for getting it from the other end, from your kind of um, journey through it, 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 it appears it doesn't go away. It, 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 it becomes manageable depending on what you've got going on, but there's always that you know, the time where your children complains of a stomach ache and you're like, stop pulling a fast one. It's only because you've got PE into school. You go to the school ring you up, they've been sick and you're like, oh, misjudge that one. You know, and there's there's that, isn't there? There's that constant line of, you know, stop messing me about, go to bed or, you know, eat, eat that. And then you realise that, you know, it's not that they're messing you about. They really, really don't like it. And you're like, oh, right, OK. Um, and, the, and that's the kind of thing with parenthood, if I'm from my perspective anyway, it's just constant trial and error. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because every child is so different yeah. as well. Um, and it's really hard not to compare them um, either with your own child. Um, I've only got the one, but my niece is um, a few months older than my little boy. So they're actually, they go to school together. Um, mm-hmm. And the difference between my niece and my son, um, academically especially, well absolute worlds apart but it's really difficult not to compare him and just think no he is he's in his own lane he's doing his own thing and actually his progress for him right now is appropriate for him yes it's great that my niece is progressing well and doing her thing but I guess like I remember going to a baby group when he was like a month old and it's so hard not to compare them to other children around you yeah and don't those mums who just you know celebrate the fact that their child have got teeth like like it's some kind of achievement and you like they're just um with all due respect teeth just grow they're all going to come through at some point you don't have these gummied adults with no teeth like it's going to happen and I do think that there's sometimes if I'm being brutally honest mums are the worst culprit for bringing other mums down and which is why movements such as yours and having conversations like this where people are just actually being real, this is what it really was like, um, is so, I think, important. And where I surrounded myself was I, I quickly identified that those are not really the mums for me. I really want to have conversations with people who are going to speak the truth and tell me how they're really finding things so I'm then safe to say how I'm really finding things that's so much more beneficial than sitting around with mums just talking about how wonderful everything is because I found that really difficult absolutely and I also think there's an element of um people not telling the truth in those situations I feel like people equate um if their child is sleeping if their child has got teeth or if they're rolling or crawling or whatever it might be they equate that to am I being a good parent yes so if my baby is doing this that means I'm a good parent and if they're not this is what my mindset was when my son wasn't sleeping. I was like, well, I don't know exactly what to do to help him. And he's not doing what the other babies are doing. So that makes me not be a good mother or worse. There's something wrong with my son. 
which again I feel guilty for I absolutely feel guilty for doing that but on the face of it everyone was saying that everything was wonderful and they their babies were doing x y and z but actually I don't think a lot of them were telling the truth which is really unhelpful and unhealthy like why why must we be ashamed that we find parenting difficult it's the most difficult thing on the world in the world that's why God gave childbirth to women otherwise we would have failed frankly <laughs> what if men if men were in charge yeah <laughs> 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 I mean, obviously, child rearing, I appreciate, is a, is a two pronged approach uh, and men do it just as well as women. That's not what I'm saying. But the whole that baby bit, like having the baby is, you know, that's mainly down to us. And there's a reason why we got that job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So. So, yeah, it's really it's really important to just be honest about that, because, like I said to you before, if just another mum hears that. I struggled or you struggled or you found it hard or someone else if they were just over over listening to someone in Costa having a, a conversation saying oh my god you know it's no I'm really I'm really feeling it now I'm really finding it hard if they overhear that they go oh I'm not alone I'm not alone so that means that there's nothing wrong with me as a mother and there's nothing wrong with my baby and that is oh powerful and really important to hear because they say it takes a village to raise to raise a baby and that doesn't just mean people in your immediate vicinity to he literally help you with childcare, but just people to be in your space and just give you that kind of emotional validation support and just people that like you say you can offload to and just feel safe to say I'm finding it hard as well yeah. And when you look at what parenting brings you, it brings you a, a, a mass of chemicals going on in your brain and actually changing the physiology of your brain. So your hippocampus um, shrinks during pregnancy in the first year, I think, of your child being alive. So baby brain is an actual thing. It's not just something that we make up. It is a real thing, although I'm not sure mine's ever grown back again, but that's just as an aside. Um, so you've got that, you know, you your body has been through it because it's brought life into the world and continues in some cases um, to sustain life. And that takes a toll on your body. You're not sleeping. So therefore your cognition is impaired and that in itself affects the chemicals in your brain. So you're trying to do the hardest thing in the world um, and you're nowhere near your top form and that's the truth of it and women give themselves a tough time I think women's particularly and I know men do too but women give themselves a tough time because they don't look the way some people do after they've had a baby they're not back into their you know size whatever it is clothes um they can't breastfeed sometimes you know their baby looks unkempt because they've got I mean why is all baby food orange what's that about you know like there's it it's difficult and when they when they sit down and think and say I feel like beep word I'm not coping this is really hard they blame themselves and actually that can be so damaging for for a woman um in particularly because they maybe don't cut themselves the slack they need. If that baby's still alive, then you are doing a great job. Absolutely. Or, or the, you know, are they got a clean out? Have they got a clean outfit on? Are they growing teeth? That's all ancillary stuff that society has put on to parents um, to be able to, you know, to show some sort of achievement. But actually, you know, in those very early days, if you're keeping everyone alive, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a there was a great meme I saw, I think, online the other day. And it was a picture of like a mum um, on the sofa with um, her baby. And there was like piles of washing around and toys all over the floor. And um, the dad had come home and she said, oh, I don't really feel like I've gotten a lot done today. And he said and he kind of pointed at the baby and was like, he's still alive. You've done more than enough. And I was like, yes, that is it. That is it. <laughs> and I do, and I definitely think that that took me some time because certainly when I had my first one, I was all very much about keeping the house nice, you know, all all of this. Um, and by the second one, it was a bit like you know, you come as you find. Yes, you stand I'm very impressed. Consider yourself lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And that is yeah, just coming, being able to come to that realization of doesn't have to be doesn't have to be perfect. Like 
if it's if the floor is clean enough for them to have a little roll around on that's it that's it everyone's going to be okay so brilliant okay so let's talk about self-awareness yes let's do that okay so I think particularly for parents of very young children, but it does absolutely continue because as your children get older, their challenges are still there, different, but they're still there. Um, And I think there is this misconception that uh, parents, but particularly mothers, have to give up their sense of self uh, to become mum. Um. And mum is a very important role and a very important persona. Don't get me wrong. Um, But you must never lose your sense of self. Um, Because if you forego everything that keeps you well for the sake of your children, inevitably you're going to suffer, but so will they vicariously. And the way I kind of explain it to people is, you wouldn't take your family for a ride in a car that didn't have diesel, didn't have oil, didn't have brake fluid, didn't go through its MOT, didn't have the right tires, um, you know, didn't have water. You would not put your family, the people you love most in the world, in a car that was not in the best condition it could be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same for when you are caring for your children. If you are not well and don't have that kind of self-care that self-sense of self um how do you deal when deal with things that when they go a bit wrong or when you have an additional challenge because the chances are it will impact you significantly and you may not be able to bring your best self to that situation um and I, I mean, I've spoken to lots of women, particularly, you know, I go back to the disordered eating side of things that they're like, well, I, I don't have I don't have time to, to do that. I don't have time to look after myself. I don't have time to prepare myself um, a healthy meal. And I get that it's challenging. I'm not saying that this is easy. It's about priorities, because where are the priorities? Is there something that actually you don't have to do? Sorry, the doorbell's gone. The dog's going to go. That's OK. It's always going to happen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if you if you always prioritize your child and their every little need um, over your what actually are big needs, um, then you're going to fall into the habit, of, um, fall into the habit of neglecting yourself, and you will not even always appreciate um, how neglected you've become until your mental and physical health starts to really suffer. And I have coached women where I say, "Tell me about you." And they tell me about who they are to other people. And I'm like, oh, that's lovely. But who are you? And they've gotten to a point where they've completely lost their sense of self. They don't really even know what interests them. They don't know what they like to learn about. They don't know, you know, what they do if they ever got downtime because they feel the time. And that's the other thing is this mum guilt that comes of you have a small snippet of time. I don't know when your child starts nursery or they're in childcare. And, and you're like, right, well, I must clean the house. Or I must do the washing and I must get dinner ready. And I must, do you know what? Why, why is your need so far down the list? What's wrong with taking yourself for a nice walk outside and just being in that moment or reading that book that you've been trying to read for two years or, you know, catching up on whatever it is you want to watch on the telly, having a daytime sleep. I still am a massive fan of a daytime sleep. My children are massive. I don't care. If I get a chance to take myself off for a daytime sleep, I am there. Um, And the other thing that I think is something that I would advise parents in particular is that we, as parents, whether we like it or not, we set the tone and we are role models for how our children are going to be when they are parents. And if we are showing that our children that when you have children you no longer exist your needs no longer count and you basically just work yourself to death caring for your child's every need um that is the bar you're setting for them for when they become parents um so it's it's not yeah it's not just about meeting their needs as young people it's about what what message are we giving to them for when they become parents definitely um and i think going back to um wanting or feeling the need to to fill the time is I think because 
the introduction of social media as well um and I don't know what your opinions are of Mrs Hinch or any of that kind of um space she is like a she's like a people call her like a cleaning queen so she's on Instagram and before she got really famous she was just like cleaning everything and so I feel like there's a lot of pressure um for parents to have an immaculate house um and to needing to fill any kind of spare time with doing something um towards a household and maybe as also as well because sometimes if you have a partner that isn't overly um contributing to the household sometimes I think to myself oh I'll do that now so I don't have to do that tomorrow or always trying to because I think parenthood you all you never feel one step ahead you always feel two a few steps behind yeah. so I don't know if it's like a switch something in your brain going try and get ahead of the game because then you feel like you're on top of everything so if you see on Instagram if you see on TikTok mums that just look like they've got their SHIT together Mm. And you th- and like people, I think aspire to want to be like that. Go, I want to look like I've got my stuff together. I look, so that means that I look like I am coping as a parent, as well. Yeah. So what they're aspiring for is um, a calm mind and a and a strong sense of self. Why are we using other people's marker posts for that? Why does our house have to be clean before we can feel like that? Why do, why, why does everything need to be done before we can feel like that? Why can't we just take it back a notch and go, okay, my house might not be immaculate, but it's clean enough to be getting on with and it's safe. Uh, my children are fed, maybe not with the you know highest quality home cooked food every single day, but they are fed. Um, why, why must we set this bar so high? And why must we do everything to the de- why? Why is our needs so far down on that list? Like what, what is the purpose? Because if the purpose is to look to other people like we have our shit together, why is that even a priority before? How do I feel in myself? Like 100%. This come first. And you have to really make peace and do some soul searching of what is important to me as an individual and what is important that I give to my children because I mean you've seen me you'll rarely see me with a full face of makeup to be honest with you I haven't got time for that that's not a priority for me I'm not saying it shouldn't be a priority for other people if that's important if you like to wear makeup then you should be making time for that if that's important to you but I make time for the stuff that's important to me so I will I will exercise regularly because it keeps me sane you know so if I don't get to put the hoover around because I'm going for a run that's what I'm doing. The hoovering's getting done another time because by the time I've done the hoovering, and this is the other thing, I'm sure you understand as well. You do do all of that stuff. You get on top of it, and then your children come home. Yes, and you're and you're <laughs> either like, what was the point of that then? Or you're like, don't move, don't breathe, don't touch anything. I've cleaned, and you're like, right, I need you know, and I, I need this house to stay clean. What are you even talking about? Your house is not staying clean if you've got children and dogs and whatever like I have and a builder husband who walks in with dust all over him. You know, like set the set the bar to what is manageable in your life, not what is on social media. Um, and make sure that part of that plan includes looking after yourself and taking time for yourself. That must be part of the plan. Don't make your children endure a mum who is constantly losing her shit or is feeling sad in herself and is not looking after herself because not only is that not nice for them to see, but it's not a nice bar for them to have to live up to when they become parents because whether we like it or not, we are role models for our children and we are going to make mistakes. Even if our house is immaculate, our hair is done, our face is beautiful, the children have had a vegan meal that's been cooked from scratch we're still going to mess it up sorry to tell you people I mess it up regularly daily I get it wrong but I'm trying my best yeah and I've got that resilience to kind of know this is life you get it and sometimes that also is an important 
message to give to your children is, do you know what? Just because I'm a parent, no one gave me a rule book. I don't know anything more about parenting than the next person. You are literally my trial run because I haven't done this before. <laughs> You're um, my experiment, yeah. Li- you know, literally, every now and then I'm going to get it wrong. And as long as I put my hands up and say, do you know what? I messed up. I shouted at you when I shouldn't. Or, you know, I kicked off about that when I probably didn't deal with that the right way. Um, it's about a const- constantly it's about constantly learning but in order to do that in order to have that resilience that ability to learn the kind of downtime to look at things objectively objectively you need to create some headspace and in order to do that you need to look after yourself you cannot do that when you run ragged you cannot no it's that that age-old saying as well put your own uh ulster mask on before you put anyone else's on because otherwise you won't have you won't eat won't have the energy to do that to look after someone else um and in the most kind of extreme circumstances I worked with a mum once who um had three kids and she crashed her car with all three of her kids in the back because she was so tired she was so sleep deprived and all she was doing was putting her kids first um and she was like that's the moment and some people have to get to that moment don't they they have to get to kind of the bottom or something that goes woof that can't happen again that absolutely can't happen again um before they realize that um kind of it's it's too late so do you have any tips to kind of help mums along with that or things to look out for or things they could do on a daily or a weekly basis to not let themselves get lost so much if that makes sense yeah stay away from social media like don't get me wrong social media has a purpose it has a place and sometimes I go on it obviously I promote my business and I do stuff through there but just be careful who you have around you the people you connect with the stuff you watch on social media um you can get sucked into this apparently ideal um person of who you're trying to be it doesn't exist it doesn't exist and I think probably I would say most people waste not in one go necessarily but waste probably an hour a day on social media um and if you put doing something for you and for some people going on social media will be the thing they do for them if that gives you pleasure I'm not saying you know don't do it you should be doing something else what I'm saying is if you're going to do that make sure it's promoting your well-being making sure it's good for you and you're not just looking at you know skinny people wishing you were skinny or people who've got clean houses wishing you had a clean house or a bigger house or whatever see what it's doing for you check in with your your mental well-being um journaling I'm a huge fan of journaling it doesn't have to be reams and reams and take up half an hour of every day it can literally be five minutes in the morning right how am I feeling today um what's important to me how am I going to find time to to um be grateful because gratitude is a huge thing and what you find is you train your brain so when you start looking for things to be grateful for very small things like I'm I'm always grateful that I have a warm bath because I realize that in the world not everyone gets to have a warm bath so I get into a warm bath and I think oh my gosh this is what a luxury this is a cup of tea bird song peace and quiet um you know a chance to read a book these are very small things that you think do you know what thank you thank you for this moment so things to be grateful for recording these things so you can remind yourselves on harder days that actually there is a lot to be grateful for because I think some days are easier than others and sometimes we just don't have that strength to find the things to be grateful for so if you write them down then they can be a great aid memoir. And then, you know, five minutes of a night, just recapping. Again, if you can take notes, great. But just um, what do I feel good about that's happened today? Um, What did I find challenging? Is there a way I could have maybe dealt with it differently? So it's just that kind of reflection, really, of the day. But being non-judgmental, more observational, more objective when we do that. Uh, I'm going to say it. Exercise and movement, people. I have to say it because exercise and nutrition 
are huge factors on your mental well-being and I know when you have a baby that is really really hard because you eat a lot of carbs or if you're like me you eat a lot of carbs uh, and getting out can be quite difficult especially if you've had a difficult birth or you've had a c-section I know that takes time and I've had both of those uh, and I and it was pretty frustrating but get them out in a buggy push yeah. them like you know I used to take mine to, I've got lakes near me so I used to put push mine in a buggy take the dogs so I could kill two birds with one stone and I'd run around these lakes like no one's business with this like baby like because I needed it that's what that's what I needed but it doesn't have to be just about running I know that's not for everyone but swimming you know getting in the water even with your baby um doing a bit of yoga while they're in a pen or on a chair or whatever you know whatever you do with your baby when you're not holding them um bit of yoga, bit of movement, bit of meditation, that kind of thing is really good. And just stack up on the healthy nutritional snacks. So make sure you've got your fruit, even if it's frozen, don't even worry about it. Seeds, nuts, lean meats, things like that, because I know they're a fat peeps, but they make a massive difference. Um, and I think the other thing is, as we said before, is, is uh, just connecting with the right people, just get the right people in your life. And that can sometimes be hard because we don't always choose the people in your life. I've I've certainly had some uh, negative influences in my life at one time or another, particularly um, about parenthood, where people had very strong views that I didn't share and was made to feel bad. Um, stick to your guns. Do you know what I mean? Stick to your guns and just be a little bit mindful with the parenting books, some of them. Just, I always say to people, use your parental intuition. You know your baby and child the best. So it's okay to onboard information. But at the end of the day, just always listen to your gut when it comes to your own children. Absolutely. Yes, because these books are written for a reason. And that person doesn't know your child. So your set up, your child. I mean, I know Gina Ford used to bang on, didn't she? And I'm not saying I'm not against it, but about routine, Re routine, 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 routine. But that's wonderful until you have the second child because they've got all different kinds of stuff going on. You've got a dog that needs walking. You know, you've got shift work to consider. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot that on paper sounds like a great plan, especially if you have not yet had your baby. You're like, yeah, well, this sounds great. Um, and then the reality hits um, and it can be very different. And and it's just a case of don't worry if you feel like you've not done as well as someone else because you don't know their journey. And, and we have good days, we have bad days. That's part of the human experience. But just kind of reassure yourself that you're doing a great job. Like, you know, like we said at the beginning. Cut yourself a bit of slack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. You don't. You just have to do you know, the best you can do with the tools that you have, but the, one of the tools you have is you. So yes. invest in that tool. Absolutely. It's so important. Absolutely. And it just you were just reminding me of something as well, um, like on um, either Facebook groups or Mums Net when I, when I was pregnant, it was like if you had, um, I don't want to say a normal delivery because I don't believe in that kind of language when it comes to births. If you had a vaginal delivery and you didn't have any pain relief, it's like people expected to be given like a certificate or a trophy. Or if you had to have a C-section or even wanted a C-section, it was very much made to feel like you didn't do it the proper way or you lose a bond with your baby and I was like what on earth is that about as long as your baby is alive and you're alive surely that's the success you want so why are people well, like, trying to compete yeah. well I mean lots of women and children died in childbirth many years ago before we had these scientific interventions these are the things we need to remember is that they are there to give you the best chances and and then it's not foolproof. This is a very dangerous thing. Bringing a baby into the world is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so take all the help you can get. I mean, mate, I had, I was on drugs for about three days before I had my daughter. And the, the, the irony is, is they handed me this tiny baby and went, look after this. I was like, are you joking? I wouldn't give me a goldfish. Do you know how many drugs I've had? Like, <laughs> Give, give you her and they expect you to start breastfeeding straight away they're like they go straight on the breast I'm like well how about if I didn't want to breastfeed they're like mm. I'm like well is it not my baby and my choice how I feed my that's another thing breastfeeding and formula feeding I don't care how you feed your baby as long as your baby's fed 
it's no one's business. Just get on with it and feed your baby. And the thing is, when you're a very new parent, these things feel massive. But when you have had when you have had the luxury of being a parent for a few years, you realise that that tiny bit of about the feeding at the beginning is like a really small bit of their life. And let me share something with you guys. Um, breastfeeding, great if you can do it, but you've got so many opportunities to mess it up along the line. Don't, don't think that that exempts you from all the other stuff that you've got to deal with and get wrong, okay? So do you know what? <laughs> yeah, can, we, can, can we not put on the university application? But I was breastfed, so that gives me a, a leg up in life. And that means that all the mistakes that my mum made after that are, are, you know, we don't have to acknowledge them because she did breastfeed me for four and a half years or whatever, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, absolutely. My, my sister is a midwife, um, and I remember her talking to me about breastfeeding and promoting. And then when she came to having her child, she couldn't breastfeed. And, you know, it is just one of those things. That's why formula exists, people. Yeah. It, it exists for a reason. You've There's not no- failed. Absolutely not failed. It's just one of those things. It makes no difference. My husband and I, we're the same age. Um, he was bottle fed. I was breastfed. Um, we are in terms of our growth, in terms of our economic status, uh, you know, academic achievements. Um, we we're exactly the same. There's literally been no impairment between one and the other. Um, because bringing up children is so much more than how they're fed in the first year of their life or whatever it is. It's so yeah. much more than that. Yeah, absolutely. Just just getting fed. Doesn't matter how. Um, I was one of those parents where I was like. When it comes to weaning, I'm going to boil everything, puree it. I'm going to write on pots the dates and put them in my freezer. And I did that a couple of times. And then my little boy just like spat it out. And I was like, who am I kidding? And also I was like, he's not going to have a McDonald's until he's at least five years old. Mm-hmm. Well, guess who was sitting in a high chair eating a Happy Meal at 18 months old and has continued to do so <laughs> for a number of a number of uh, visits a year to mcdonald's it doesn't like it seems like a big thing and i feel yep. like we feel like we, we will get judged on that but actually mm-hmm. it's not it's just a mcdonald's it's okay he's not having it for breakfast lunch and dinner, dinner every single day mm-hmm. so mcdonald's is going to be just fine and this is the thing isn't it if we if we must breastfeed, if we must home make all the food, if we must use reusable nappies, if we must have them in clean clothes every minute of the day, you know, when are you going to find time for you? When are you going to find time for you if that's the expectation? And does your ch- child really need all of those things? Don't If you want to make some fresh food so you can mix it up with jars or whatever, that's great. I did that. If you want to breast and bottle feed, that's great. If your choices are your choices, but... If you're constantly living up to the expectations you think you should be reaching, then when are you ever going to find time for you? And why is you so far down the list? Why can't they have um, a jarred meal so that you can um, not stand in front of the oven, uh, you know, for two hours on a really sunny Sunday afternoon um, and, and make fresh food? If you would prefer to go for a walk, like just. And the truth is, they don't care. And another thing that I'll tell you is they don't remember. <laughs> they don't remember how much sacrifice you made to keep them alive in the first three years of your life, of their life. Yeah. They don't remember. Um, so you might be able to, and, and it doesn't matter how great you are as a parent, they are still going to tell you one day that they hate you and you're crap and you're the worst and they wish they could be someone else's child because they get to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so just bear that in mind, parents. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Well, on that note, um, (laughs) thank you so much, Emily, for joining me. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, And you are at Quiet Mind Coaching. Um, I will drop your link into um, into the group and on this um, channel as well. Um, But thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we've had a really I've had a really good time and um, I think we've had some fun together so thank you so much and I and I hope people have found value um, and just so that you know my children are both very much alive um, they're they are reaching most of their academic achievements where they come from who knows I mean just a tick box exercise by the education system whatever uh, <laughs> yeah. and um, I've managed no one's taken my children off me so yeah keep winning going. and I get winning. to run. and I yes. get to 
So it's, it's worked out well in the end. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. Pleasure.